centuries, the galaxy knew peace. For centuries, we waited. Until the Empire returned, attacking without mercy. Until we struck the Republic, reclaiming our ancient home. Now we must defend the Republic. Now we begin our true assault. Though many have died. And though the Republic bites on. We will prevail. We will destroy them. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, welcome to Star Wars The Old Republic here at Comic-Con 2011, San Diego. I give you those last pieces in case you don't know the date or the location. San Diego, 2011, now you know. Um, my name is Dallas Dickinson. I'm the director of production at Bioware Austin, working on Star Wars The Old Republic. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about the game today. Uh, we have a couple of things we're going to go through today. Um, we have a brief overview of the game for those of you who are unaware of its details. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, do a big question and answer session, so hopefully we'll answer some of the questions you have, probably not all. Uh, we have a special swag giveaway, so please stay until the end so you can hear all about that. I think you will be pleased. I'm just letting you know. It's good. Um, so uh, up here with me today, we have a couple of our most important uh, contributors uh, to the game to talk along with me to answer some questions for you. Uh, we have our game director and uh, lead designer on the game, Mr. James Olin, everybody. Uh, sitting next to him, we have our executive producer and the man who signs my checks, Mr. Richard Vogel. And then finally, we have uh, our community manager and whipping boy for everything that pisses you off, Stephen Reed. There he is. So, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Has anyone ever seen these words before? Anyone? Yes, all right. So when you see that, you know that something amazing is about to happen. You know that you are about to enter the Star Wars universe and you're about to see an epic story unfold. So we know that this is what we've been trying to create in all of our work, trying to build Star Wars The Old Republic for you. And that's why, when you play the game, this is the first thing that you're going to see. Now this will be per class, obviously. It would be kind of weird if you were playing as an agent and you saw that. I have to tell you, we had the game running for a very, very long time without having this feature run. And when this finally happened, um, it actually came in sort of as a surprise to me. And this sounds like PR bullshit. I totally got chills. I freaked out. When you had that pause, and the bam, yeah.
So there you go, yeah. So now by, by way of background, um, everybody should know, but I'm just gonna tell you again. Uh, the game takes place about 3,000 years before the rise of Darth Vader and before the films. Um, it also takes place about 300 years after the events of the original Knights of the Old Republic. So this is the place uh, between the, uh, the original Knights of the Old Republic and our game start. Um, we've actually been showing some cinematic trailers through over the last couple of years talking about what has happened since then. So we released them in reverse chronological order just to mess with your mind. This is return. This is actually the beginning when the Sith Empire returns to reclaim their ancient homeworld of Korriban. Now, we also showed you hope. This actually depicts when our Republic heroes start to turn the tide of battle on the planet of Alderaan. Let's go, move it up! And then finally, though first, Deceived. This is when the Sith Empire actually reaches the culmination of their, uh, of their plans. They destroy Coruscant, they sack it, and they force the Treaty of Coruscant, which puts us into the very, very tense Cold War that is the setting for the game. But of course, that's not where the story ends. That's actually where the story begins for you as players. This is the world that you come into when you choose your class. Now, we have talked about the fact we have eight classes in the game. They represent some of the most iconic heroes and villains in the Star Wars universe. So you, you choose your class, very nice. Um, you choose your class and you're gonna play a unique story per class that is several hundred hours long. Now what that means is that if you choose to play the game as one of our Republic classes, as a Jedi Knight, you're gonna play the entire game, hundreds of hours of story and gameplay. And if you decide you wanna start again and play a bounty hunter on the Empire side, you will not see one single duplicate mission. The entire game is unique for you. So, so this is what we mean when we talk about unique storytelling, storytelling that makes a difference. Now, in addition to your personal class story, there's obviously also an overarching story, a story about the struggle between the Sith Empire and the Republic, and that's what you're going to be participating in with, with all the people in this room, with all of the thousands and thousands of players in the game, and that also unfolds as you're playing through. Now, like any other Bioware game, you're not gonna just be sitting back and uh, watching the story play out. You're gonna be making decisions. You're gonna be making choices in the game that leads to a unique game experience, a unique story for every player. Now, you start off very simply. You, you choose a faction, you choose a class, you build a character. But pretty soon, you start making more and more choices, very specific choices that will, that will lead you to your personal story. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of choices that you're going to run into. Each choice is going to contribute to your story, exactly, who, who would make that choice? Um, <laughs> to make your story a unique one. Now, these choices define your character, whether you're playing as a, a bounty hunter with a moral code, whether you're playing as a trigger-happy trooper, um, if you maybe play as a, a truly noble and just Jedi Knight, or a vicious and cruel Sith warrior, your story is gonna be your own. Now we're going to show you one quick example of a, a choice, the kind of choice you're going to have to make throughout the game. This is a game footage, um, it's, a, it's a, a decision made by the Jedi Knight when he's on the planet of Tatooine. He's actually pursued a Sith Lord uh, across the planet and defeated him into a, in a duel. And he's going to have to make a choice, so let's watch the clip. Such skill. So much power. Impressive. There is nothing more to say. You won our duel, finish me. So what do you want to do? Uh, anybody? If you would like to choose the dark side, I would like to hear you boo and hiss as loudly as possible. Okay, all right, now, if you want to choose the light side and spare him, I would like you to cheer and, I don't know, giggle? That, that, I'm gonna say that that's, that's pretty much split and uh, also because the way we built the presentation was we assumed you'd kill him. Uh, we're gonna kill him. So, <laughs> dark side choice. Give me great satisfaction. I am ready. May the force be with you. Uh, so the galaxy is a poorer uh, one, Sith war, one Sith Lord. However, you kinda wanna see what would've happened if you made the other choice. So we're actually gonna show you what the other choice would've been as well as its repercussions right here. You won our duel, finish me.
You may serve the Empire, but I won't kill you. Jedi are taught to see all possibilities. I see one where you live on with honor. Commit yourself to the path of light. Become a Jedi. Me? A Jedi? Impossible. Your order would never accept me. The only way to find out is to ask. I accept your offer. I hoped we'd meet again. You changed my life on Tatooine, and I never had the chance to thank you. You've come a long way since the last time I saw you, Lord Praven. Just Praven. That title doesn't hold any meaning for me anymore. It's a strange thing, saving lives instead of taking them. But it feels right. So... That, that's a pretty extensive, extensively different choice and a different result. This is the kind of long-term choice you're also going to get to experience in the game. And it's, again, it's what makes your personal story so unique. In this case, there's actually a Dark Lord of the Sith who's been turned to the light side and has become a power for good in the universe. So it's a big deal the way that choice actually changes your personal story in the game. Now, one of the things you also may have noticed about our game is there is a little bit of voiceover in it. Um, this is, in fact, the first ever fully voiced MMO. We've, we've talked about this before, but there are hundreds of thousands of lines of dialogue. Yeah. yeah. Tens of thousands of characters, and especially with some of our most important characters, our player characters, our companion characters, we wanted to make sure that, that these characters you're going to be living with, or sometimes living as, are going to be some of the best voiced characters in game history. So we've gotten some of the most amazing voice talent working on our game. We're going to show you a quick clip showing some of the talent you're going to hear or be while playing Star Wars The Old Republic. <laughs> Until the Sith have been defeated, there isn't time for much else. Being a fan on the level that I am allows a little bit of director shorthand. Uh, the director's able to say to me something uh, along the lines of, um, I need a little, uh, a little more Jedi to it, and I'm able to, you know, sort of give it a little more Alec Guinness or, or whatever. <clears throat> We're on Nar Shaddaa, right? No one does anything for free. It recognizes a, 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 a well, a goal I didn't know I could ever achieve. And at the same time, it's like coming home. It's, it's, it's taking on a world and entering into a world that I know very, very well. Wow, we're really meeting Mandalore. Oh, this is gonna be incredible. I have such a fun time playing Mako because she's a really tough, no-nonsense, like, go-getter. Yet she has a really good sense of humor and she has this very dry sort of wit about her. Uh, don't get too far ahead of me. I, I really don't want to be alone down here. But she's very focused and she's very driven. And um, she's a little bit, you know, she's a tougher character than I am. So it's a fun char character for me to play. We all have our masters. Jedi Council standards are high. Playing a Jedi. Oh, It's very exciting. I mean, it's, it's literally like I laugh on my way to work. I'm going to be a Jedi today. It's, it's awesome. It'd be wise to have our ships pull back until the task is complete. It's everybody's dream. I mean, who doesn't want to, you know, be a Jedi and kick butt and have a lightsaber? It's a great job, I'm not gonna lie. One more cheer from you, little bird, and you'll regret it. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Ow, jerk. If you don't like that, just say so. I can do other animals too. Dire cat, frog dog, waking monkey lizard. So that is a vet. She's a she's a, a Twi'lek treasure hunter who gets uh, partnered up a little bit reluctantly with our Sith warrior. And I'm guessing that the first question you have on your mind after hearing that is, what is a Kowarkian monkey lizard? Actually, some of you know the answer to that question. But the other question is, who is in fact providing that voice? Does anybody know? No. I'll give you a little hint. Uh, she may have also provided the voice of Mission in the original Knights of the Old Republic. Anyone? No? All right, everybody. Just all kidding aside. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Mrs. Catherine Tabor. There she is. Now, she's going to be up here for a, a little Q&A, um, but I, I do have one quick question for you, Catherine. Do you know what a Quarkian monkey lizard is, and can you do an impression? Um, but being a professional, if I did my impression right now, you guys would have to pay me. 
So, uh, Mr. Reed, actually, can you can you provide us? Yeah, uh, Mr. Stephen has right. mentioned he can do a Kowarkian monkey lizard. <laughs> there we go. There we go. A little salacious crumb. Excellent. Uh, so we, we and that was nice. That was also. We're not going to have a contest. Please don't start that. Um, <laughs> All right, so we have uh, one more character we're going to show with you. It's actually the first time we've revealed Wherever this companion. You are, that's home to me. Whatever happens, I want to be with you always. Now that is Nadia. She is uh, one of the companions to our Jedi Consular. And as you might have guessed from that little clip, she is in fact one of the companions. You have a choice uh, to perhaps try and romance. Um, now, this may or may not inform whether or not you take that choice because we also have with us Miss Holly Fields. Holly Fields, please come on up. Well, thank, thank you both for joining us here today. As I said, um, uh, we will be having them participate in the Q&A, so if you have questions for the, for the actresses, please uh, put those in the back of your mind right now. Put some of them out of your mind right now. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, now, now uh, as you've seen, from voiceover to unique storylines, um, the commitment to story is what makes the, uh, the Star Wars The Old Republic really, really a game changer in the land of the massively multiplayer game. But we also have to address the other pillars of, of a truly great RPG. Um, those are exploration, progression, and combat. And we're gonna talk a little bit about each of those right here today. Uh, I'm actually gonna let my boss, Mr. Richard Vogel, talk to you a little bit about exploration in the Old Republic. Thanks, Dallas. What better universe to explore than Star Wars? Seriously. Everyone remembers from the movies these great planets and iconic locations. Well, in Star Wars The Old Republic, you will get to go and visit these planets that we so dear and love, like Tatooine and Hoth, for example. One of the great things about our planets and locations is not only will you see planets that you're familiar with with the Knights of the Old Republic, but also new planets that we develop that have never seen before in the expanded universe will be shown in our game. One way to get around to these planets is your personal ship. Think about it as your mobile home in space. Your personal ship, our ships dedicated to each class will have its own unique ship that they can use and explore the universe, which is pretty damn cool. Now, one of the good things about it is you can see this, galac this galaxy map, which you can get on your ship and allows you to travel to different planets. Not only that, it can get you into space combat, like you're seeing here. So great uh, map that you can explore the universe with, you can get into combat battles like you see here. Now, many of you think, well, these planets like Tatooine and Hoth are huge. How am I gonna get around? Well, you may have known about the previous uh, releases of vehicles that we've shown, but we're also gonna show some brand new vehicles that we're gonna show you. So for the higher level gameplay that we have. There you go. From the forest moons to Tatooine. So now, these are really cool in the game. Trust me, they're awesome. And the neat thing about it is like, with Luke Skywalker, the land speeder at his time was pretty common, but back 3,000 years ago, it wasn't. So you needed the land speeder it was more of a higher level type gameplay and good drivers you have to have for that kind of a vehicle. So we're reserving those for the higher level gameplay in our game. Now, remember that the vehicles will change probably as we get to launch. So what you see here are just preliminary versions of what we're gonna have. But when you get to the game when we launch, they'll probably be even better looking and cooler than what you see here. Let's Dallas talk about progression. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. Um, Richard Vogel, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, again, I mentioned progression. Um, uh, this is a role-playing game, so, so you're going to be progressing throughout the game. It's one of the tenets of making a truly great RPG. We also showed you a little bit of the type of progression that you choose yourself uh, through the choices you make in your story. It actually changes not only your character, uh, the way the story unfolds, but actual aspects of your gameplay. But on top of that, we also have hundreds of really amazing powers, abilities that you get, tremendous uh, armor and weaponry upgrades, ridiculous, cool-looking stuff. So if you want to take a look at 
some of the visuals of what you might look like in the game as you progress. We're showing a few of them up here, but if you want to really see the full depth of it, make sure you go to the website, StarWarsTheOlderPublic.com. We've been releasing progression videos um, every few weeks, and we've shown many of the classes and, and what they can look like at the lower levels, what they look like at the highest levels. So if you really want to know how to look awesome, how to impress your friends, um, uh, check it out on the website. But last but not least, we want to talk a little bit about combat. Now, we've, we've certainly talked a little bit about this in the past. We've said, you know, in Star Wars The Old Republic, we want to make sure that combat is evocative of the movies, that it is fast-paced, action-packed. Um, it really feels visceral and, and smooth. Um, on top of that, though, we've added something that is very much a Bioware tenet. We've added companion characters. And uh, James Olin is going to talk to you a little bit about companion characters generally, as well as companions in combat. Mr. Olin. All right, thanks, Dallas. Oh. Thanks, Dallas. Um, so companion characters have been an integral part of Bioware role-playing games for more than 15 years. For those of you who are familiar with Bioware role-playing games since Baldur's Gate through Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic all the way to modern games like Mass Effect and Dragon Age, they've always been a huge part of our games. And they're going to be a huge part of Star Wars The Old Republic as well. In fact, if you think about it, companion characters are kind of huge to the Star Wars movies. Han Solo has Chewbacca and uh, Luke Skywalker has R2-D2. So being such an important part of our game, um, such an important feature, uh, we're always looking at ways to polish, improve, um, and make changes to companion characters as, the, as our game develops. So um, most of these changes come from feedback that we receive from players, fans, such as yourself, that are currently playing our game, lucky enough to right now. Although do not, do not violate your NDA right now. You can't tell people you're playing yet and uh, obviously internal sources as well. So there's, uh, you know, we've been making a lot of different changes, some small, some big. Some of the uh, smaller changes we've been doing to companion characters. So right now when you play the game, you can actually change what your companion character is wearing, um, his weapons and all the rest of uh, his equipment. Um, but we've been getting a lot of feedback that says that players want to actually be able to change what their companion character looks like. So we decided to give them that uh, ability. Um, so you'll notice that, uh, for example, that up here, um, a Twi'lek, a Twi'lek uh, can have many different kinds of skin colors, whether it's red or yellow or blue. So we're giving players, and this is just one example, the ability to change, for example, the skin color of their companion character. A minor tweak, but just to kind of show you guys how the game is developing as we continue to get feedback. Now we've also done some much more significant changes to companion characters and I kind of have to be a tease because I can't really go into too much detail but we'll be talking about it in a few weeks. But basically we've been taking feedback from our fans and some of the players um, that has said that they really want to be able to have the ability to customize and adjust the AI, the artificial intelligence of their companion characters in the same way that they've been able to do in other games that Bioware's made such as Dragon Age. They've also expressed the desire to really be able to have a lot more control, the depth of control that people are used to in, in Bioware RPGs. So we've been making those changes, um, and we're going to be testing them, and uh, we're really quite excited. So I can't wait till we can talk about it in the future. Anyways, that's it for companion characters. I think we're going to uh, Q&A now. I think we are. Um, so everybody who has a question, uh, please, we have a microphone there. Line up. It looks like nobody has any questions. That's Do really unfortunate. Run. Um, while they're lining up, I actually have a couple of questions uh, for our actresses here. Um, so, so Catherine, um, you obviously have worked on not just uh, Knights of the Old Republic in the past, you've worked on several other Star Wars properties, now you've worked on Star Wars the Old Republic. Can you tell us about the, the big difference between working on the original KOTOR and working on uh, Star Wars the Old Republic? Well, the original Coder um, mission was my very first voiceover job, so I had nothing to compare it to. But when I got my script, which was about this big, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to take forever. And we worked on it for you know, a little while. But when I got my script basically for this game, <laughs> I would say over the course of the years that I've been working on it, my script probably is this big. And we've a couple, a couple on of it. lines there. It's yeah, crazy. so it just shows you how deep you can go into the universes here in the storylines. And we make you memorize them every single every one. Every single right. one of them, right. yes. And I, I don't get paid if I mess them up. So. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, but the stories are really deep, and, and you really get to see that just, just from the acting side, how much, how much deeper you get to go into the storylines and, and make your choices and stuff. It's, it's unlike anything I've ever seen, and I'm pretty excited about it, too. Well, thank you. Um, so, Holly, is this, this is your first Star Wars uh, game to work on? Yes, I've been doing games my whole life. I usually work on Shrek for everything for Shrek, for Cameron right. Diaz. But yes, my first Star Wars, and I didn't even know I got the Star Wars game because I was told it was the Old Republic, so 
and I had auditioned and I thought I did horrible and I got home and found out I got it and my agent's like, by the way, it's, you know, it's Star Wars and I, I'm the biggest fan of Star Wars. So, of course, I screamed and my neighbors heard me and called the cops or something. No, it, yeah, you so said it's, it's an amazing character and I'm so thrilled to be a part of it. Excellent. And it's Excellent. a hot character. She's very sexy. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> You'll like it. Does anybody here like Star Wars? I don't know if you do, because we all like Star Wars. A little bit. Um, all right, so I, I think we have uh, some questions there. Uh, pardon me? Oh, gosh, yeah, I'm sorry. If you do ask a question, uh, we were going to actually give you a copy of Deceived, the recent novel by, uh, by Paul S. Kemp, uh, which tells the story of Darth Malgus. So if you didn't already get in line, you're kind of way back at the end of the line at this point in time. But <laughs> we're going to get through as many questions as we possibly can. So uh, first question, please. Yeah, my question is actually for anybody who can answer this. How many people did you have doing all the different voiceovers, and how long did it take you to record all of the different voiceovers? Uh, that's James, I think, maybe can answer that best. So how many actors and actresses? We talked about this last week. How did we? Yeah, well, um, sorry. The, um, we actually mentioned this last week on the site. Um, the official number at the moment is over 900 um, actors and actresses, uh, and apparently that number is still growing. Um, I, I can't comment on how long, but that's the number. Yeah, we've been recording for about, I say, uh, over two years now. And that's, just, and that's uh, just English, actually, I think. Oh, maybe yeah. that includes French and German, but yeah. All right, we're just talking about English, English right now, so yeah. yeah. Multiply English. by three. Yeah, we started writing the scripts in 2006, to give you an idea. And I think we actually had some of the dialogue that is in the game start getting recorded in 2007 or 8. So, one of those years. It's been a long project. <laughs> <laughs> it's taken a while. Uh, yeah, next question. Yeah, and if you have, do have a specific person you want to ask, be sure to just put their name on there. Okay. If we turn, to, if we turn to, uh, to, to Stephen, it's because we can't answer. That's actually... That's, so next question, please. Okay, because this is an MMO and not a single player game, how will an individual's story progression affect their friends if they choose to party up with them? I'll let James answer that here. Um, so each player has his own class story. And uh, his class story is what we like to call his personal story. So your personal story is not going to impact the personal stories of your party members. However, we also have um, all the rest of the stories in the game are actually group content where, and I don't know if you've been able to see our demos of it, but you're actually able to engage in multiplayer conversations with your friends. Um, it's actually, it's uh, completely unique to our game, very innovative, and it, it kind of harkens back to, um, for those of you who are old enough to have done you know, tabletop Dungeons and Dragons. It kind of harkens back to those days when you have like a whole bunch of friends around a table and they're arguing about what they want to say to the NPC. And you know, the dungeon master says, all right, well, he heard you and you know, he was pissed off. And then the other, you, know, you get mad at your friend for saying that to the NPC. It really harkens back to that. That was our inspiration. And it, it really has that feeling to it. It's, it's a lot of fun doing the multiplayer dial dialogue. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Next question, good question. Uh, oh, my question actually had a lot to do with that. So. Um, uh, but I'm curious, how are you going to protect characters from, say, um, say I am trying to be light side, or say I don't want to kill the guy, or something like that? Is there a way for me to experience the other side? I mean, if the, just because that guy has a higher stat, and yeah, I think again, a little better. James, James has a good answer to this one because I, I like the way this works. Go, James. Oh well, um, again, if it's your personal story, you don't have to worry about that because all the decisions are yours and yours alone. But if you're in one of the multiplayer conversations. Um, we went back and forth on this one, uh, but we don't want to dissuade players from actually grouping up um, because, you know, if, if you're getting dark side points because your buddy killed the princess, you're going to be really pissed off. So we just, you know, decided that what you internally felt, your choice, when you make the choice, even though you don't actually win the role, um, you get the points according to what choice you made. Um, so it's intention, right? The, the universe yeah. knows that you had dark side in your heart there. So. <laughs> Yeah, so, so if, it, it, depends on, in, in case, it depends on who wins the role at that point in time. So you'll get to see the dialogue play out based on who wins the role, but you'll still get your points for what you wanted. But you can't see what happened the other way. Uh, no, unless, but of course, the thing is, if you do play as another class on the same faction, um, you could then see what would happen. Yeah. Or you can watch YouTube about a week after the game is released. <laughs> there you go. Uh, next question, please. Ah, hi. Uh, it's more along the lines of uh, the design of the armor, because, you know, looking into the trailers and at the troopers, uh, I was wondering how much of the original source material from the trilogy, uh, prequel, and the uh, 
and of course the Holy, uh, Holy Trinity, uh, how much of an influence did that play on the armor design for the uh, Republic Troopers? Well, I wish that, I wish that our, our art director, James, uh, or Jeff Dobson, was here, Jeff but, Dobson, yeah, he but you, you want to you hit this, James? Yeah, it's a, a huge influence. It's um, Obviously, we've taken a look at all the movies, and that's influenced how we've done the armor for every single class in the game. It's actually um, one of the decisions we made way back in 2002 for Knights of the Old Republic was we could have had a, an art style that really looked ancient and medieval, but we felt that you know, that would kind of alienate all the Star Wars fans. They wanted to play a Star Wars game that looked like a Star Wars universe. So we really are taking all of our um, uh, influence from, from the movies, and you're going to see that in the game, just like you saw in Nice Old Republic. Yeah, you'll, you'll see that in the, in the starships as well, I think. If any of you have actually seen the personal starships, they also are very evocative of, yes. the, of the ones that you're used to from the, the more modern movies. See, Star Wars is really more space fantasy than it is science fiction. And in fantasy, technology never changes. So. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool, thanks. Yeah. Next question, please. Hi, yes. Um, I wanted to know if you're allowed to tell us how many planets are in the game now and are more planets scheduled for release in later expansions of the game? I think this is probably a Steven question because he, he's the only one who knows the, the appropriate answer for it, whereas I think like, we, we would all come up with slightly different versions of this. Well, I can say that uh, we have 19 major worlds, then we have... Um, an indeterminate number of other minor worlds. And uh, yeah, our goal, obviously this being an online game that we're hoping is going to last for decades, um, we're going to be obviously adding more to the galaxy map as the game progresses. We want to uh, add dozens of worlds, hundreds eventually. In 2025, we'll hopefully have 500 Guaranteed worlds. in year 2025. <laughs> Thanks for confirmation. Thanks Sorry. for confirmation on that one. Hi, uh, big fan. Um, my question is more about the aesthetic of like armors, because um, I was watching some of the videos and saw that higher level armors do look incredibly detailed and awesome, but can we mix and match without taking detriments from lower level armors? Like if we wanted to keep a low level helmet that looked cool to us without taking detriments against a higher level one? Um, so if you don't upgrade your armor, um, that will have an impact on the statistics for your character. So if you keep a low level helmet on, that's not so great. Um, for your ability to fight. However, um, when designing the armor system, we, we knew that Star Wars isn't just another fantasy game. We really needed the character classes to look like the iconic character classes uh, from the uh, movies. So we have a couple systems in place. I won't go into the details on them, but essentially we've made it so that your trooper is going to look like a trooper, your bounty hunter is going to look like a bounty hunter, he's never going to look like a clown, like you a might. Hybrid. Yes. It's a hybrid. Unless clown. you choose to make him look yes, like a clown. Yes, you could do that. You can choose to look yeah. like a hybrid. You, you clown, can try but... to look as crazy as you want, but. Do we have clown noses? <laughs> clown is not a class oh, okay. in the game. <laughs> we also have um, one of the things we've. Uh, we do have set bonuses in the game. We really want to encourage players to wear the same set so that when you're running around in the uh, Star Wars The Old Republic, you're seeing lots of other players who really look like the iconic classes. All right, thank you. I just want to know a little bit more about in-game content, if you could tell us anything. Um, is it going to be geared more towards just the raids that we've seen already released on the website, or is there going to be any solo or group content, small group content planned as well? This is all for you, James. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, the Elder game is a, is a huge um, part of our game. It's very important to any massively multiplayer game, because once you get to the end of the game, well, some players are going to re-roll, and we have more information to talk about that at some point in the future. But there's, uh, then there's going to be players who want to continue on with their 50th level characters. I'm allowed to say 50th. Yes. yes. All right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Thank you. Um, I'll kick him. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so we have lots of different Elder Game activities. There's obviously there's the War Zones. Uh, there's the Operations, which are our version of Raids. There's um, our Flashpoints, our high-level Flashpoints. But we also have single-player content. In fact, we have an entire world um, that's devoted to the Elder Game for players who aren't grouped up. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. It does. Thank you. This question's for uh, on the develop development side of the game. When you guys are uh, polishing worlds for graphical detail, do you guys uh, like put an entire team on one world at a time or be like, okay, you three go on Tatooine, you three on Hoth? Uh, Rich, do you want to take this? Yeah, we have, we have pods set up. Uh, these pods have different areas of, uh, that they're responsible for, and they have programmers, designers, and artists working together. And when we get to the polish stage, there are more uh, designers and 
cinematic designers and artists work together and they work through the planet and they punch it out. And it's also done through, through play testing and feedback through play testing as well as pl uh, everyone in our studio plays our game a lot and we provide that feedback. So that all okay. goes to the pod teams which they create a punch list to get the plans to the polish level we need. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Hey guys. So basically this game is uh, coming after a game called Star Wars Galaxies that was kind of a disappointment. Uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, it is, has the Knights of the Republic name on it, which is probably the greatest Star Wars video game series of all time. You are going into a massively multiplayer game, which, I mean, through history, hasn't been the easiest market to break into. And you've been developing it for a very long time. My question is, how much pressure do you guys think you're under? <laughs> well... <laughs> That, that's a great that's question. question. That's an awesome question. I mean, there's a lot of, everyone has their different vision of what the game will look like, right? And expectations are always different from different people. We try to make sure that we match the iconic roles that people want to play in the game and that we try to fill people's fantasy. That's what we try to do in this game, that people who watch the movies, they want to be Boba Fett, they want to be... Uh, they want to be Han Solo. Well, you can be that in our game. That's what we want to try to achieve. And yes, an MMO is, uh, has lots of systems and very challenging to create a universe. And this is, this is why you think we've taken a long time in this game, where Bioware believes in making something quality. Quality is very important to Bioware's name. And so we want to make sure that when you enter our game that you have the experience and fun that, that we so strive to achieve. Thank you. And I think it, to, to, to the stress thing, um, you know, it, it does make you age faster. I'm 14 years old. <laughs> you know, it does a number on you. Yeah. Thank you. Next question, please. When traveling with the use of a ship, are you guys going to have a quick travel, maybe by the use of uh, jumping to hyperspace from planet to planet to make things faster? I'll, I'll let James answer that. Well, if you're talking about um, the time it takes when you enter hyperspace to go from one planet to the other planet, we actually had a couple different design ideas on that. One was that it was going to uh, be, there's going to be a, a long, you know, it was going to take five, six minutes for you to go through hyperspace to reach a, a planet. Time. But then we decided to make it more instantaneous. So it's, it's a very short hyperspace jump from planet to planet. So you could already, you could say that we already have a quick travel system okay. in the galaxy map. We also have, um, obviously, on the worlds themselves, because the worlds are huge. I don't think, um, some people were worried. I always, thought it was funny when fans were worried about us making a linear or small game like your typical Bioware RPG, single player RPG. Um, our worlds are massive, Tatooine and Alderaan are examples of that. They're just huge. And so we've had to put in other systems, obviously the speeder bikes and the land speeders and other quick travel systems uh, traveling on shuttles that allow you to traverse those worlds much faster. I, I don't think I'd put a, a clock on it, but if you, were to, if you were to try to run from the furthest corner of Tatooine uh, across, it, it's easily like half an hour. I don't know. It, it's, it's, the planets are huge. So we, we, we put in a lot of systems to make that so that's, so that's cool and yet not painful. Um, you're like, wow, this place is huge, but I'd really like to get over to uh, Moss Eisley. So help me Thank out. You. Yeah. for the character actors. Um, what is the favorite part of your character, their plot, or just the elements of your character? Can you go first? Go ahead. Okay, my favorite part of my character? Your character well, or the storyline of, of well, your character? Oh, God, there's so much storyline. Here, here's what happens is you go in, they don't really give the, us a lot of detail because it is a big secret. They make us sign away our mm -hmm. first child, actually, <laughs> in the contract, <laughs> almost. No, uh, but they give you three uh, different choices of lines, so you'll, you don't even know like what's being asked of you, really, because I mean, they want to keep it a secret. And then, then you have a great director directing you on how to say it. But my favorite part of my character is that there's a huge transition with my character. She starts out, I was actually told she was originally kind of made after the character in Splash. Mm -hmm. So she's a little naive, but she gets stronger and stronger. And she just, she's the character that I wish I were in my real life. She's the coolest character. But, uh, and what was your other part? I'm sorry. Uh, about the plot. The, but the, you just said that you oh, really I'm not really out of I don't, no wanna, I don't wanna ruin it for everybody else that doesn't wanna know, but it's, it's a good plot. You're gonna like it. <laughs> very sexy and she's kind of, I mean, there's so many dimensions to this character and that's all I could probably say without she getting killed. 
Yeah, but you can. For, for Vet, one of my favorite things about Star Wars and being a huge Star Wars fan is the, the sort of comedy that you saw, particularly in the original trilogy. And so I feel like Vet brings a lot of that to the game, you know? Um, and it's also fun because there's dark side stuff, which I wasn't used to being able to do, which is why I have my Sith Lord shirt on today. Um, but it's just that, you know, like in, in all the seriousness and all the killing and all the fighting and all of that, it's also classic Star Wars to have that, that fun camaraderie banter stuff. And that's what I think Vet really brings. Plus she's a Twi'lek, which is just cool. So. Yeah, and it's, it's really well written as well. So the, the writing is, it, it's, it really, there's, it brings a character to life. You really feel like you are playing with a real person. It, it, it's amazing how the graphics are just incredible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Hi, um, I am just got done with my first year of college, and I was, this question for all the panel. Um, how did you get your start in video games, and do you have any advice or insight on how to get a job at Bauer Austin? Maybe next Never time? do this. <laughs> <laughs> how did you get your start in video games? Um, so, what, what, well, I guess we can give you very quick uh, versions. Um, I, I got, I actually came uh, from, a, from a theater and English background, um, but I played a lot of games, and so I sort of fell into a production role on a, a sort of a minor production role working on, on, uh, on online games. I guess I probably can't mention the names. Um, in any case, I, I just fell into, a, and fell into a role because I had a production background that had nothing to do with video games. Um, but I found that I loved doing it so much and was a gamer myself that, that I kind of just kept doing it for, uh, for the last 15 years. Wow. For the last 15 years. <laughs> Put things in perspective <laughs> is what you do. Uh, I uh, started in journalism and uh, moved across to sort of web journalism and then ended up in, in community. Um, and the one thing I would say for anyone who's like at college level or anything else, do not be fooled by how much work it takes to get into the games industry. It's easily, possibly the most competitive industry of, the, of all the creative industries. So if you want to get in, you have to work damn hard. So I kind of got lucky. Um, I was with Bioware <laughs> as a startup. You know, I was lead designer on Baldur's Gate, so I, that was pretty lucky. If you want to know how to get into, uh, into game design, um, I like to always, uh, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, um, they have a program called the Guild Hall, which yep. trains designers. It has a 97% placement rate, and uh, I've hired so many designers from that place. I think without that school, Star Wars The Old Republic would be in big trouble. So. Yeah. <laughs> Here you go. I started, uh, I was a programmer and a finance major, and then I said, I can't do a suit. I'm not going to do that. And so I went to film school, and then I kind of luckily just found uh, a program position at the, at the place I was editing at and, uh, and fell into doing video games. So I've, I've loved it ever since. Um, I guess that was for the development folks, not, not for the, uh, the actresses. Uh, one, one more question here, folks, uh, before we have to start wrapping it up, because we have a couple things to share with you. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for being here. I just want to know if you could talk a little bit about how PvP is going to work. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think we can give a, a quick overview of that, Mr. Mr. Olin. Very well. Very well. Yeah. And in fact, uh -huh. you can come, if you go across the street to uh, the Hilton Gaslamp Hotel, we are showing Alderaan Warzone PvP uh, for the entirety of Comic-Con. Yeah, so seriously, go across the street, Hilton Gaslamp, and, and, uh, and check it out. Yeah, we have some really good talent working on that. We've, uh, a lot of Warhammer folks came to uh, work, help us out on the PvP side, and it's really coming along great. I'd have to say that uh, a lot of us in the office, including I think me and Dallas, were never really big MMO PvP fans, and we're now giant. Yeah, PvP we, we, we fans. play it all the time uh, now, and, and it really is like the, the system is very it's very accessible for the for the, the noob uh, to PvP, and then but then the people who are really really good at it, they're really good at it, and so there's a whole lot of depth to it as well. So it, it's a really really fun uh, fun way to play. All right, so I think that was our last question. We have a couple more things we want to show you here. Um, before I tell you about your awesome, exciting swag, uh, we're first going to show a quick trailer here that we put together. This is using entirely game footage, um, and this is a premiere. Nobody's seen this, this so, before. No one's seen this before, so yeah, here check you this go. out. You'll like this.
good Imperial is a dead Imperial. I wasn't planning to live forever anyway. I'm in. May the Force be with us. My hate knows no bounds. Dangerous jobs are my specialty. I'll eliminate any threat to the Empire. There will be no survivors. So, I don't know if anybody caught that last frame. Uh, you may have already heard about this if you have access to the internet, um, but pre-order, everybody. Uh, so we have just started pre-order. Um, actually, I'm going to let Steven talk you through the details of, uh, of pre-order and how this is all working. Um, but uh, but that, that is our big announcement. We just started uh, as of midnight, la or this overnight, 12.01 a.m. today is when we started allowing pre-orders for the game. Uh, I think I think Dallas is scared of saying the wrong thing. So um, I totally am afraid of saying the wrong <laughs> thing right now. <laughs> so I'm just going to quickly go through here. So we have three editions for Star Wars: The Old Republic uh, available to pre-order. The first is the standard edition. It's available as a digital download from Origin.com. It's also available at retailers. The uh, second would be the digital deluxe edition. This is exclusively available as a digital download from uh, Origin.com. And last but not least, we have a collector's edition. <laughs> This is a very limited supply, and uh, between 12.01 a.m. and uh, about five hours ago, this actually sold out at Origin.com. Um, it is still available at retail. There are many, many more copies available at retailers than there were at Origin.com, so I would suggest you go to your uh, local retailers, although I heard Amazon sold out for a while, too. Uh, so yeah, that is available. And just to give you a quick glimpse inside the collector's edition, it contains the following items. We have the Journal of Master Nostral. Anyone who's seen our timeline series on the uh, website will remember that uh, Master Nostral was responsible for those. So anyone who's into those timelines will love that. Uh, we have a Darth Malgus statue, nine inches tall, which looks great on your desk. Uh, we have a galaxy map, of course, showing the entire known galaxy during the time of the game. We have a brilliant Music of Star Wars, The Old Republic CD, 17 tracks. Uh, we have a security authentication key fob. I know everyone thinks that these are very important these days. And don't worry, yes, you will be able to get these if you don't buy the collector's edition. And last but not least, of course, you have the game itself. Oh, and plus seven virtual items, but we're not going to go through those. Today. Gentle Giant will have that statue to look at at the show, too. Yes, they do. So go to the Gentle Giant booth, and you can actually check out Darth Malgus. It's awesome. Um, so we have one other final little bit of business, um, and that is, in fact, the swag we're giving you, because everybody here in this room, you have a pre-order. Yeah. Right, so so you, you, need to take, uh, you need to take your ticket uh, to the, to the Comic-Con fulfillment booth, wherever that may be. Um, and we will give you there, uh, I believe, a card um, that, that will show you your, your pre-order your pre-order code here. Um, now, just so everybody knows, this is not the full game. This is just the pre-order code. Uh, um, it is it is to be redeemed only for the digital standard edition. So if you need a deluxe edition, you got to get another one. Um, so uh, so you still need to get on that. Um, and then finally, you still have to purchase the final game via Origin.com. That's how these codes work. So this is this is the way you have to use it. But Everybody in this room has already pre-ordered Star Wars The Old Republic, and I hope you all enjoy it. Um, so I think there is, there is one other question that people are probably wondering, which is, when can we play the game? Um, yes. 
deficit? I'm going to give you a couple answers. Um, the first one is that we are doing our uh, very large beta testing weekends coming up very soon um, in September. So everybody, if you have not signed up on, on StarWarsTheOldRepublic.com to be one of our testers, do so. We're going to be allowing huge numbers of people in. If you haven't gotten in yet, this is going to be your best chance to do so. So sign up right now to be one of our testers, and there's a very, very good chance you'll be playing the game in September. We're going to be inviting, as I say, thousands and thousands of people to jump into the game, try it out, and give us their feedback. Now, if we're letting in huge numbers of people for beta testing weekends, that probably also implies that we will be releasing this game uh, at some point in time. Uh, again, so I don't say it incorrectly, I'm going to hand this off to Mr. Stephen Reed. Mr. Reed. I just have to put on this hat, um, which some people may understand why. <laughs> So, uh, yes, we are going to be uh, doing beta with, uh, testing weekends in September. And uh, right now, our release window target, we are targeting holiday 2011 as our release window. There you go. Uh, so be ready to spend the holiday. I just want to say it, it's very important that we, we want to make sure that we have a very good quality product. And this is why we don't give you an exact date that we're going to release it. Because when we go through testing, we'll figure out whether we have a good quality experience. Because that's more important to us than anything else. The other thing I want to mention is the pre-orders. So if you order pre-orders, first, it's first come, meaning get it now to get in line for pre-orders, because we are going to do a limited launch. So we're not, because of the big demand that we're having, we're all going to limit it launch. So the sooner you get in, the sooner you'll play our game. Right. Very so important stuff along. there. Excellent. Um, and again, as, as Rich said, you know, we, we're committed to giving you like the, the Bioware quality experience that, that you all expect. And so that's the reason we're not telling you today. Um, we are, we're giving you a range, but that's because we want to make sure this is the best possible game for everybody out there. So I think that that's all that we have time for, everybody. Um, one other thing. What is that one other thing? Oh, hey, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mentioned that you can obviously play the game here at Comic Con. Uh, we're here in the Star Wars Pavilion on the main show floor and obviously across the road as well at the Bioware uh, base. Please come by right after the uh, panel. Catherine Tabor is going to be signing at the base literally right after we leave here. Holly will be signing there tomorrow. Alexander Free, one of our writers, is also signing tomorrow at 3.30. Andrew Karpishan, author of uh, the upcoming Revan novel, is signing Saturday at 12. And last but not least, we have a special surprise guest waiting for you under a black tarpaulin at the uh, Bioware base. So please come by and find out who's under the tarp. Hint, it's not me. Excellent. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. Um, thank have you. a great Comic-Con, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in Star Wars The Old Republic.